Welcome back to our program, Hollywood Structured. As some of you already know, our program is designed to help the young people who wish to enter the entertainment field. May it be music, nightclub work, theater, television, or film. It is also designed to help the parents and the educators of those young people to make them understand their wants and their needs and the pitfalls and the traps they may fall into unless thoroughly acquainted with the inner workings of Hollywood. Today, as our special guest, we have a gentleman who never saw too many movies when he was a child, and the movies that he saw were silent, but he was fascinated by them. However, at the age of 10, he made a couple of very important discoveries that took away his life. He was playing with some friends in their parlor, and there was an upright player piano in which you put a roll and it would play the latest tune. He did not know that if the roll were not there, you could play the piano. One day, rolls were not there, he tried them, and he played, he was fascinated by them, by the piano and the sound. And his second discovery was his father took him to his first movie with sound, it was called The Crusade. And he was fascinated by the sound of the music. He always listened to the radio at home. And at the end of the movie, he asked his father if he could go behind the screen to see the orchestra. And his father said, the orchestra is in the film. It is not behind the screen. Well, right there and then, this gentleman decided, I'm going to write music for film. When? How? He didn't know. But I guess he was right because he has won up till now 20 Grammy Awards and four Academy Awards for music. His name is Henry Mancini. Hello, Hello Henry. Ma How are you? <laughs> Thank you for being on our show. Usually at <clears throat> this time of the program, I teach or lecture to the young people out there about dreams and about responsibility, about training and patience and perseverance. But after reading your book, and I suggest you read it, did they mention the music? I became fascinated because I realized that your life and your struggle through the years could illustrate to perfection what I try to convey every week, which is that it takes a long time to become a star overnight. <laughs> so today I'm not going to lecture, I'm not going to teach. I'm going to do it through you and your life. My first question is, I understand that the town in which you were born made the Guinness Book of Record? Uh. No, uh, uh, the town I was born would make the Guinness Book of Records for other reasons. It was Cleveland, Ohio. But the, the town you're talking about is uh, in Pennsylvania called West Aliquippa. And it made, not the Guinness, uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not, that's what it made, yes. It's the only town in the world that they could find that had one way in and one way out. Was it a tunnel or something? It sure was. <laughs> it was under the railroad tracks. Some people live across them. I live under them. You know? I see. Uh, at the time, the, the town was segregated, I believe, right? Uh, not really, no. Uh, not on purpose, let me put it that way. Uh, it was a, f a strange town in that I'd never seen any uh, like this before. It had like plan, plan 6, plan 12, plan 11. It, it sounds strange to talk about it like this. And... Uh, like we were in West Aliquippa, which was another part of it, and it was uh, almost all Italian, almost a hundred percent Italian. And then we had other places that were almost uh, that were a hundred percent black. You know. So you are really <coughs> first generation American. Yes. Mm -hmm. Your dad was Italian. My dad was born in uh, in Abruzzi, uh, way up in the mountains there, and he. Uh, he left when he was 15. I can't imagine anybody making that trip, 
You know the, mount yes. uh, the mountains of Italy are like being on the moon. And uh, he made that trip and uh, finally ended up in, uh, at Ellis Island, just like many, many, many other people yes. at the time. My mother did too, but she, didn't, she was a bit more or less of a baby when she came over. I see. Now, um, you played music when you were young, when you were in school? I started when I was eight. When I was eight years old, uh, my dad, who was, we've ended up in this town in Pennsylvania, and uh, he played, he was an amateur flute player, amateur musician, and in addition to making his living in, in, the, in the steel mill, that's where he worked. And he gave me the, uh, gave me a piccolo, you know, anybody that plays flute also plays piccolo, which mm -hmm. is a s small one, and I was just a little kid. And uh, I started on the, on the piccolo, and then later gravitated, gravitated, where did that, that come from? <laughs> later took up uh, piano, and then after that, at about 13 or 14, I started to arrange music, not knowing what I was doing at all. Now, what do you mean by <laughs> arrange music at 14? Yeah, <laughs> what do you mean by me? <laughs> well, I had been listening, in addition to playing flute and piccolo in the bands in the school, uh, and, and then I started becoming, that was all classical oriented, you know. I became interested in, uh, through the radio, because all the big bands were on at that time, became interested in uh, popular music, and at that time the big bands were starting to really uh, take over. Miller, Dorsey, Shaw, that whole, the whole swing band era, plus a lot of the black bands. Uh, Fletcher Henderson, Basie, Ellington, all of these people. That was their heyday. It was uh, not in the beginning. It, it was just the beginning of that whole thing. And I became interested in what they were doing, what they were playing. And to this day, I can't remember why, why I decided to, to write, to write music. I don't, I don't know. If you ask me, I, it just, you know, when you're a kid, uh, you, you kind of, I mentioned in the book having tunnel vision. You know, where you just, you get your eye on something mm -hmm. and uh, nothing else matters. And that's what happened. I, I just got completely taken over by, by music and by, uh, by these bands. Now, did your father approve of you uh, not finishing school? I mean, you finished high school. Oh, I finished correct? high school, yeah. Yes, but not going to college or anything like that? No, he didn't approve of that at all, no. He, he even after, after... Uh, success. My mother was gone before that, uh, but my dad was around to see all of the, mm -hmm. uh, the Oscars and stuff like that. And even after, I think even the night that I won my, the two Oscars, I think he, he said, you know, you better, you better go back to school, kid. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he, never, he never had any faith in the American dream. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Okay, now, you studied at Juilliard, did you not? I did, I studied. I, I went to, uh, to New York to, uh, when I was 17, mm -hmm. and while I was in New York, I turned 18, and while I was turning 18, the country's at war. <laughs> and, uh, did you go to war? Yeah, yeah, I was in the service three years, and I uh, was drafted from, uh, from New York City. Did you, did you fight? Did you go into the music department? Uh, well, I started, uh, I started in the Air Force. And fortunately, I uh, was sent an assigned, assigned to a band, uh, an Air Force band. I was there for a while, and then for some strange reason, uh, they broke up a lot of the Air Force bands. Uh, because they needed more soldiers. You know, they th how, why they thought that this flute player was going to be a good soldier, I don't know. But I then went to the uh, ground force, and I went through the engineers, and I was in a lot of things. But mostly, fortunately, uh, and thank God, most of it was music. Mm -hmm. Now, you met Benny Goodman <clears throat> at that time, did you not? Well, that was before. I, I did. I went to New York originally to... Uh, in addition to going to school, I had done an arrangement 
for Benny Goodman, my teacher Max Adkins in Pittsburgh had uh, had Benny give me a chance to do an arrangement for him, and he liked it very much, and he sent for me. He didn't send for me, but I went to New York, and uh, we. Uh, I wasn't wasn't ready at all. I'm 17, you know, and I was not I was not in the uh, prodigy class or the genius class, you know. So I had a lot to learn about what I wanted to do. And uh, Benny said, "Hey, kid, you know, <laughs> you're not ready." So, but anyhow, it wouldn't have made any difference, really, because I was soon drafted. Um, when you came back from the war. You started playing in big bands? Yes. When I was in the service, I made some very good friends who, when the war was over, my, my best friend, Norman Layden, uh, became like the musical director of the Tex Beneke Glenn Miller Orchestra. Mm -hmm. It's Miller Band after, after the war. And f I went there and uh, as a pianist and as an arranger. And uh, spent a year there. And that's where I met Jenny, my wife, you know. Oh, um, 42 she, years. 43 years, actually, now. 44 years. Sorry. Next year. <laughs> After that. Yeah. But I understand, if I can take one <laughs> second, that you turned her down to start with. Well, you know, what would you do if you were on, in, you know, you're, you're on the road with a band and <laughs> uh, there's a lot of action out there. And uh, I, but uh, turned her down. I guess it wasn't that. I, I just didn't, I didn't want to get her on the road. Yeah, get the picture. You know, she was singing, by the way. She was a singer. And she was singing with a group called the uh, Mel, not the, the Mel Tone. Well, that was before with Mel Tourne. Mm -hmm. But the Mellow Larks. And uh, she came with the band, and uh, I was the pianist, so I had to rehearse, teach the group their mm -hmm. their uh, their music and that's how we 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 got together but uh i didn't well i didn't turn her down for long <laughs> i'll tell you that <laughs> Not for very long. she was very influential in your life wasn't she <clears throat> well it's because of uh of her that uh i came out i came out to be married but it, it kind of worked into the overall overall plan very well because uh this is where i wanted to be they were, she was from California. Yes, yeah, she was right? a nat native Californian, and she could not stand. She, we were back there at one, one of the worst winters that has been in the East in, in this century. And uh, she wasn't equipped for it, uh, she, uh, mentally or even physically, because uh, she hated it. Slush and snow. You know, it used to snow a lot in the East uh, <laughs> all winter, and it doesn't do that much anymore. Well, that, that, that might be a good thing at that. So now you come to California, mm -hmm. and somehow you get on the Universal lot. Well, there was a few years between 47, we were married in 47, uh -huh. and uh, 1952, I uh, went into Universal to start, uh, to start working. I went in for two weeks. And, uh, I was in the music there. department? Yeah, no, yes. I was there six years. But it was a great, uh, it was a great place to uh, learn the trade, the trade, my craft, really. And I, I did everything there. We, uh, in those days, uh, motion picture companies were making 50 to 55 movies a, a year. And those were all kind, of, every studio in town was doing that. That's, you know, just about that time, it started to go down. The uh, television started coming in in the mid-50s strong and by the time uh 1960 came around uh, the movie studios were having having uh, having problems some of them had changed over to television warner's was smart uh some other studios were smart universal was not too smart in that respect they sold out they they didn't they didn't think television was something that was going to be around finally they sold out to mca which now owns mm -hmm. uh, universal um, and you, s I, I really want to, you to tell me about the fact that at that point you lost your job. And oh. <laughs> you came one day back to Universal because yeah. you had a pass, and you came to get a special haircut. That's the only, th that's the only way I can phrase it. 
any haircut is special for me. <laughs> it's like seeing an old friend go, you know, everyone. Uh, I but would, it, uh, it really yes. muddled your life afterwards. Yes, well, I was uh, at Universal about the time, and I had been, we had all, the music departments had all been dismantled in most of the studios because the studio bands, the studio staff orchestras, no longer existed. They found that they, they were getting fewer and fewer pictures and they couldn't afford to have a band on staff. In addition to that, all the composers and arrangers, such as myself, were let go at the time. Uh, but I was out then, and then I, I used to come back uh, to go to lunch at the commissary. Mm -hmm. In those days, Universal was a very uh, sleepy, homey kind of place to be, you know, not like now, as they call them, the factories, mm -hmm. the studios. So I went back and I had my hair cut uh, in the barber shop there, and uh, it, it's it's adjacent to the commissary. You come out of the barber shop, and the commissary's here. And I was coming out of the barber shop, and Blake Edwards was uh, going in to have lunch with some people. Uh, among them was uh, in that group Don Sharp. He had just had a production meeting to see how they were going to do uh, the new show he had called Peter Gunn. And as I was coming out, he was going down, and they were talking about the show, so I guess he asked me if I wanted to do it. Best offer I ever had. <laughs> and you have been working with Blake for the last 20 years. 20? 25? 30? 30 years. Oh. I'm very good at my fingers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 30. We, well, we started more than 30. We started 1958 with, uh, with Peter Gunn. And since that, the new picture that I just finished with him, it's called Switch, is, I think, 25th or 26th we've done together. You started becoming known on your own and getting your first screen credit at that time, correct? And During the time at Universal, time. yeah. But I started to be my own boss because, you know, I was part of a music department at Universal and uh, had a great head of the department, Joe Gershenson. And he did most of the conducting, except for composers who did their own conducting. Mm -hmm. Hans Salter was one, and Frank Skinner was another. But we, I never com conducted until Peter Gunn. And now they can't get the stick out of my hand. <laughs> <laughs> you do travel and you do concerts. I do, constantly. yes, I do a lot of concerts. And uh, recently uh, uh, have started recording again after uh, being away from that for a while. Uh, I'm back with RCA. I was with them for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm uh, it's going okay. <laughs> Let me ask you something. I was fascinated reading in the book about how you score mm -hmm. a film. Do you read the script first? Sometimes I read the script, but uh, sometimes you can't tell by a script. I have never been able, I'm not that s smart, I guess. I've never really been able to make sense out of a lot of scripts. Some people read a script and they say, wow, this is going to make a great movie. And uh, I, I've, unless it's really outstanding, I, I, because I guess people, like a director reads it or an actor reads it in a different way because of what, what, they, what yes. they have to do. And I don't have that. A script is not any much, not much use to me. Uh, Can you explain then to the young people how you score? A film? Well, I am called, <clears throat> except Blake, some people call me ahead of time and say, here, read this. I'll say, fine. But then I put it away. And I don't really get my juices going until the, uh, the movie is entirely finished, shot. And they finally, everybody's got their cuts in and all of this business. Because it's a matter of time, you know. And... I'm dealing with very definite periods of time, sometimes uh, as little as three seconds and sometimes as much as 15 minutes, you know. The opening of, uh, the opening of Pink Panther, the movie, has 15 minutes music. You start here and you go here before you ever stop. You don't do it all at once, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. you, it's broken up into to three or four segments. But once, uh, once I'm called in, to see the final cut, then then we start. Then then it's a matter of uh, 
talking to the director or producer or whoever else uh, has got anything to say. And recently, a lot of people have got a lot to say about <laughs> marketing people get into the music and uh, people and advertising. Everybody gets into it now because uh, it's been, uh, you know, the album has become a part, uh, has the tail sometimes wags the dog, you know. Uh -huh. And the, the album is very important to their marketing procedures. And they, uh, everybody wants to have a say. So I look at the thing and we decide where the music is going to be, what kind it's going to be. Now, do you decide or does the director or producer no. decide? I said we. Oh, we. <laughs> we, yeah, the big, the big we in the sky. Uh, we decide and, and start to, uh, and then I have, I have to, recently I've started into electronics and I have a, something in my, uh, up in, in my house, you mm -hmm. know, that uh, I can do demos on because it's, it's good to, to let them know what you're doing. And just playing it on piano is all right, but if you can make a nice demo with the synthesizers and all uh -huh. that, which I do, uh, it, it's much better for you. It gives them a much better idea. And also, I've been using electronics much more recently. I started, when they first came out in the 60s, I was interested, and I, I've been using them all the way through, but now they have really kind of uh, taken over. So I decide where I'm uh, going to put the music, what it's going to be. And about this time, I call in a man who is his official title in the, uh, in the industry is called a music editor. No, he doesn't edit music at all, but that's what they call him. They call him a music cutter, too. But he is my liaison. He is the one that gives me everything, all the information I need to do what I have to do. I see. He gives me notes. Uh, he, he, each scene is uh, typed out from, from beginning to end with the timings along the side and where everything happens. And that gets down to uh, an eighth of a second or a seventh. Or, it's very, you know, very technical sounding. And he helps me. And then he is the one that puts, the, when we record the music, he is the one that makes sure that when they go into finish, we call it dubbing, mm -hmm. putting everything together, mm -hmm. together in one room because they have the dialogue, they have sound effects, they have uh, all kinds of business that has to be put together. And then if someone needs to be looped, you know, that means you have to go back. If, uh, if there were a plane, like yes. one just went by, I think. Yes. Uh, if there were a plane, an outdoor scene, and a plane went by, and the, guy, and the actor was acting, they'll have to take that and go back into a studio, and he'll have to mimic what he was doing. No, not like nilly vanilla, you know, not no. that kind of stuff. <laughs> this, this is, this is, this is, uh, <laughs> these are real words. So, I, uh, he gets the, he gets the thing on, uh, on the tape for me. He gets the tape in sync with the picture. And, uh, from the time that I start to the time that I'm finished, it's about, usually about four weeks on a picture that... That's all? It's not, well, that's a lot. Oh, I think it's uh, extraordinary. No, no, there's, an, there's, there's time. But uh, sometimes we, uh, if it's a big picture, an epic picture with a lot of music, then you have, you have, you have to have more time. So uh, I record, and usually the average picture you can do, this is movie now, you can do in uh, four to six sessions, four three-hour sessions, or yeah. six three-hour sessions. Because you can do that because of the, 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 uh, the quality of the musicians here. They, they do this all the time. Do you use always the same <coughs> musician, or you try? Yeah, I try, but I, many times I need specialists. You know, I need to call people in that, that are unique in what they do. I want to ask you one thing. Which was the most, and I may be totally wrong, which was the most popular, Moon River or Pink Panther? Or charade. Well, I think I think Pink Panther has had more staying power, only because it has been. We made how many of them? We made seven, and uh, 
there are countless cartoons out there, you know. And the minute the, ba the minute the kid falls out of the cradle or in the cradle, that kid knows who uh, <laughs> who the Pink Panther is, <laughs> and therefore he grows up with it. It has become part of. Uh, and I make more money from uh, from Pink Panther. I see. Um... Henry, you won't believe this, but this what? is a three-minute wrap-up, and this is a time when we ask our guest, it always goes so fast, <coughs> we ask our guest to speak directly to either the young people or to the parents, young musician coming up, or the parents, or the teachers. All right. Would you like to address just, uh, one or all three? Just wave me. <laughs> wave to me when I should stop. Go right. ahead. I will. <laughs> I promise. Well... I, this affects the whole family because everybody has a uh, likes to think that their kid has has talent, you know. And 99% of the time they're wrong, and uh, that it's that 1% of the the cream that we have to talk to. We must uh, education is something that has really uh, become necessary. And when I was a kid, I could. I could get by more or less like on the seat of my pants, that kind of thing. But that's no longer true. Most of the people who do what I do now are coming out of schools and have had proper educations. And you must find, to get that right teacher is the most important thing. Uh, I would advise not going to a school just because it is a great name, you know, a big kind of name, a name a university or anything like that. Find a teacher that you want that's going to do the most for you no matter where that teacher is, in what, no matter what school it's in. Although many of the big schools, of course, have great music departments, UCLA, here in SC, in Indiana, a lot of them have good ones. But unless that teacher is there that's going to connect with you and teach you what you must know and what you have to know, it's not going to be a good experience for you. And if you have the, if you have the uh, one thing you have to have, and that's a burning desire, ambition, I don't look like a person that has that, but uh, I but did. But you did. But I still do. Okay. <laughs> was, um, that, was that stop? That was okay, a stop. Right. That was a stop. I would like to thank Hank for sharing his expertise with us. Thank you so much. Well, Lillian, it's been nice seeing you again. It's been a long time since Jenny and I have seen you, and uh, good luck on this, on this program. Thank you. Now, you people out there, Keep watching us because we keep watching out for you. Thank you. Till next time.